Hi everyone. Welcome to the next St Peter's Reddington sermon. Uh, my name is Andrew and I have the privilege of being vicar here at St Peter's in Reddington. And I need to say right from the outset, thanks a lot Church of England, for our reading today is one of the most troubling, one of the most controversial passages in the whole of the Bible. Now I tried to go with the uh, gospel reading, but it was too short. The psalm, beautiful and heartfelt, but it's more of an anguished stream of consciousness than anything else. So I'm afraid it had to be our Old Testament reading. Genesis 22 verses 1 to 14. Are you ready? Well, here goes. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Genesis 22 verses 1 to 14. Some time later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and a knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar <clears throat> and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, what are we to do with this? Because it's a shocking, appalling incident. And one of the greatest ironies is that the reason why many of us know this incident so well is that well, it was so popular as a Sunday school story, taught to little children. I myself, when I was a youth worker many, many years ago now, I remember enacting this story in a junior school assembly one time. And it was going so well, we had, um, we had an Isaac, we had two servants and we had a donkey. In fact, it was going better than well, for we were thrilled when one of the more roughy-tuffy children, who'd never volunteered for anything before, put up his hand to take on the role of Abraham. So suitably decked out in dressing gowns and fake beards, always going swimmingly, until the voice of the narrator called out that there was no need for Abraham to kill his child, for God would provide a sacrifice. At which point, it took four of us, if I remember, to hold back this child from slaughtering his classmate. What are we to do with this passage? For it's not just inappropriate or uncomfortable, it's well, it feels evil, and that's not a term I use lightly. 
But what other word can I use when it comes to demanding child sacrifice? And another irony is that in the same Old Testament, God wholeheartedly agrees with this judgment. For at pretty much the same time as our reading, there was a pagan group that demanded the ritual of child sacrifice in worship to their god Molech. And God was so incensed by this practice, so furious, that he explicitly outlawed it. It's in Leviticus 18 verse 21. Don't give any of your children to be burned in sacrifice to the god Molech, an act of sheer blasphemy to your god. I am your god. So, if it is clear that God won't even countenance child sacrifice, what precisely is going on here with Abraham and Isaac? Why shouldn't we just reject this incident? Or if not reject it, simply, and rather more cowardly, awkwardly pretend that it simply doesn't exist? Well, before we countenance doing that, I think that we need to look at this passage a little bit more closely. You see, first and foremost, and please don't think that I'm trying to let this outrageous passage off the hook, I'm not. First, I think it is clear that God never intended Abraham to really sacrifice his son Isaac. We have it right from the beginning of this passage. Verse 1, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. So this incident wasn't, was about testing faith, not about promoting an act of child sacrifice. And second, it does have to be acknowledged that this incident is a one-off, a unique circumstance with a unique person to serve a unique purpose. Abraham, the founder, the one who took the first steps in what was to become the Christian faith. Here he would grapple with what proved to be the Achilles heel of the people of Israel, a lack that was to trip them up over and over and over again that lack of faith, lack of obedience, lack of trust in God. And here, in this outrageous instant, maybe God is simply, and rather brutally, underlining just how essential, just how fundamental this trust and faith is to our relationship with our Creator. Maybe it was, is, to keep it on our agenda that God made this lesson so provocative. And it was a lesson a test once learned by Abraham that never did happen again. In the entire history of God's people, both old and new, it was a demand that was never repeated, ever. And there is just one more feature of this horrendous incident that should just make us, us Christians, pause in our outrage. And that comes in verses 6 to 8 in our passage. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac and he, ca he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And jump forward several thousand years, we know that it is precisely what this same God did in Christ. No child sacrifice, but God himself, Jesus, the Son of God, God clothed in flesh and blood, who would pay the price, take our place, just like the ram did for Isaac. And maybe... Just maybe God wanted to plant that seed right at the beginning of their history and our history so that when Christ did indeed die, for the Jews there could be that pang of recognition, of recollection of, hey, didn't this happen before? When God did himself provide the sacrifice instead of Isaac. As I said, this is a really difficult passage. So offensive that it's no wonder that it was God himself who referred to child sacrifice as blasphemous, utterly repugnant. However, before we close our ears and refuse to listen, let us also be clear that looking through the sweep of God's self-revelation throughout both Old and New Testament, 
and throughout the history of the people of God, child sacrifice was and is always rejected. This command to Abraham was not, is not, normative of God's behaviour in any way. And it never was supposed to be. As I said, I think that it is clear that God never intended for Abraham to go through with it. It was simply a test. For sure, this passage will certainly provide fuel for the fire for those who wish to reject God as an ogre. But that isn't how it worked out, is it? In fact, when it came to Jesus, quite the opposite. So, so what is the intended message of this text? The lesson we're supposed to take away? Well, it is that God can be trusted. Even if the situation looks utterly hopeless and bleak, even if there is simply no way that we can reason out how they will end well, even if we have no hope, God can be trusted. And that's what Abraham and Isaac too found out. There is no getting around it. Our reading today is deeply troubling. But the truth is that God our Father, the God revealed in Jesus the Son, the God made manifest now in the Holy Spirit, is much bigger, more mysterious and greater than we can ever imagine. And we need to find a way to live with that. For as Tim Keller once wrote, if your God disagrees with you, you might, sorry, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshipping an idealised version of yourself. If your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshipping an idealised version of yourself. The call today is, like Abraham, to intentionally, deliberately, intentionally, deliberately put our trust in God. So why is God telling you this story today? Amen. So let's pray everyone. Unexpected God, when we follow you, we never know what is round the next corner. But that is all part of the package we accept when we take up your calling. You constantly surprise us with new challenges and sometimes test our faith to the limits. But you will always make sense of it later and sometimes much later. If we keep trusting you, Keep us on the road, constantly moving in, sorry, constantly moving on in our pilgrimage of faith and ever ready for the next turning point, wherever it may be. Amen. So may God bless you and encourage you. May God, may you find God where you are now. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless.